Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Good evening. I'm Whitney Espick, CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this gathering tonight. I'm so glad to see every one of you, though it reminds me that in a world without COVID, we likely would have visited with the alumni in several spots in Asia in person this year. That will come. In the meantime, know that our Cambridge thoughts are with you until that ability to gather across geographies in person returns. For now, this virtual assembly is just wonderful. Thank you for being here. Tonight's program is one of the partner programs arranged as part of this month's MIT Alumni Forum topic, Perspectives on Leadership. The Alumni Forum is a new series of online gatherings that addresses global challenges and highlights the ways in which MIT alumni are helping to create a better world. The latest instance of the forum centered on how MIT alumni at various professional and personal life stages are tackling the challenge of leadership in ways that only MIT people can, with mind, hand, and heart. Our main program this evening follows this theme as we bring you into a conversation among three of our alumni from Asia who will share their perspectives on leadership by and for women. But first, I would like to take this opportunity to give you a few updates from the Alumni Association and share a conversation I had recently with Diane Green, chair of the MIT Corporation. Our current Alumni Association president, Annalisa Weigel, will then share her thoughts on leadership and on her term as president of the Alumni Association. We will finish off the program with an opportunity for you to connect directly with one another through a series of breakout rooms, and that should be fun. I'm going to now move into an update on the Alumni Association. So over the next few minutes, I'm delighted to cover some updates, the latest figures for our global community of alumni and alumnae, the new MIT Alumni Lounge on the Infinite Corridor here in Cambridge, the new Alumni Association mark, and our plans to celebrate commencement and tech reunions in person and on campus this May for the first time since 2019. Over 3,000 alumni and guests have already signed up to join that gathering. So our overall population. In terms of our community this fiscal year, 2022, we have nearly 143,000 alumni and alumnae living and working around the world. Of those, 17% are international, and those who hold graduate degrees exclusively from MIT comprise 54% of our alumni population. Most impressive is that we are in contact with 96% of our alumni by email or postal mail. Thank you for staying in touch with MIT. There are many ways for you all within this global community to stay close, as you once did as students at MIT through your shared desire for continued learning, your points of affinity and common interests, and more. And I'm just going to remind us of a few of those. So if you are not connected through one of these pathways, we encourage you to consider joining one of the communities made available to you. If you are a graduate exclusive alumna whose experience at MIT might be different from those of undergraduates, there is a place and community for you with connection points that reflect your experience at MIT and your experience in life after MIT. Regional clubs and ambassadors provide connections on the local level, connecting our alumni where they live and work, and currently covering 122 different countries, communities, and states here in the United States. Clubs in Asia have a history of being connected to each other, and that trend has continued to grow during the pandemic in wonderful ways, as clubs have shared virtual program with each other, regardless of borders and distance from each other. However, if you live where no regional presence already exists, please reach out to our alumni outreach team to express interest in getting a group together in your area. We love bringing alumni together. 19 affinity and shared interest groups gather our alumni by attributes that are important to their identities or interests and bring those with commonalities together. These groups provide an opportunity for connection regardless of location. And because of the increased adoption of virtual programming, you can keep connected through your graduation class or your subject and share special moments together during reunions and in between through virtual events. Speaking of place, I'm excited to announce the alumni have a new place to meet others and connect right on the infinite corridor in the heart of MIT in the newly opened alumni lounge. 
Located at 10100, just steps from Memorial Lobby and Killian Court, the beautiful new home for alumni on the Infinite Corridor is largely completed. Here's an image of that new space. All you need to enter to meet a friend, to take a pause while on a campus walk, or to schedule a meeting is your MIT alumni ID. Our storytelling digital display located across the lounge, across from the lounge, has been activated and is currently sharing the MIT alumni story, possibly your story, with passersby. Also, in the early portion of this fiscal year, we launched our new MIT alumni mark. We hope you've started to notice the change across our association programming and events and feel like it is a visual identity worthy of our talented global alumni community, including you. Speaking of our community, many of you will be back on campus for tech reunions and commencement. And so after a two year pause of in person, we are excited to host tech reunions in May in person in Cambridge. Tech reunions and the connections that are made over the course of these events are valued by all our alumni. We look forward to welcoming alumni back to campus on May 27th through 29th and to providing opportunities that are available only when our alumni are gathered on the physical campus. That said, we will absolutely continue to offer some virtual programming, live streaming of the major events, class talks, you can see a list here, uh, so that those far away can still feel connected to their class and to MIT. So as we endeavor to create an inspiring set of programs for reunions, those alumni and alumni who graduated in 2020 and 2021 will be invited back to campus for a special celebration to be held on May 28th. Thus far, over a thousand have registered to take part in this special opportunity. That is a thousand alumni and then their guests and, and uh, take us up to over 3000 already signed up. For those who would have celebrated 50th reunion and 25th reunions in 2020 and 2021, there will be events specifically designed for them. The Cardinal and Gray graduates of 70, 71, and 72 will all be included in the procession for the main commencement ceremony where they will proudly show off their red jackets. I think it will be an ocean of red jackets. And while alumni are excited about being back on campus, we are including virtual components as part of reunions. And we recognize that the virtual reunions of the last two years have provided wonderful opportunities for alumni to connect with one another without the barriers of travel. So th those are some highlights from the Alumni Association, ways to connect. Um, and we're glad you're here today to take a, a step in reconnecting with our community. Uh, I am now uh, delighted to shift to the next part of our program and share some thoughts from Diane Green, chair of the MIT Corporation. Uh, before we uh, share those thoughts though, let me introduce Diane a little bit. Diane had planned to be with us live uh, to share this update, but unfortunately her schedule in the end did not allow that, but she made herself available earlier this week to share some thoughts on the corporation, MIT, and her own leadership journey. I'd like to show that conversation to you in a moment, but first a little bit about her. As chair of the MIT corporation, she presides over all corporation meetings and chairs the executive committee. She joined the MIT corporation as a term member in 2008 and was elected to a life member in 2013. She earned a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Vermont in 1976 and a master's degree in naval architecture from MIT in 1978. An avid sailor, she was the 1976 Women's U.S. National Dinghy Sailing Champion, and she holds a current sailing card at the MIT Sailing Pavilion. I love it that her card is still current. After beginning her career as a naval architect, Chair Green changed directions, receiving a master's degree in computer science from the University of California, Berkeley in 1988. She then worked as an executive, uh, an executive, an entrepreneur, and an investor in the technology industry for 35 years, holding engineering and management positions at SGI, Tandem, and Sybase. She co-founded and was CEO of the video streaming software um, VX Stream, which was sold to Microsoft in 1995. In 1998, she co-founded VMware and served as president and CEO for the company's first 10 years. After VMware was acquired by EMC in 2004, Green remained CEO and took the company public in 2007. In 2012, she founded and led Bebop Technologies, a software development platform that was acquired by Google's parent company, Alphabet, in 2015. The chair has served on boards of Intuit, Stripe, the AP, uh, the AP Mahler Maersk Holding Company, Wix, SAP, and Alphabet. 
In the nonprofit arena, she is Director America, uh, Director Emerita of the Khan Academy and has been a board member of Peninsula Open Space Trust and the California Academy of Science. She is a member of the National Academy of Engineering. A native of Annapolis, Maryland, she is married to Mendel Rosenblum, a professor of computer science at Stanford. They have two children. And now let's hear from Diane herself. Chair Green, it's great to see you and thank you for joining me for this discussion. I appreciate you taking time today to share an update on the Institute for our Women in Leadership <clears throat> program later this week. Whitney, it's my pleasure. I'd love to be there live, but uh, one, of, you know, one of my favorite events are always those focused on women. And it's definitely my privilege to be here representing MIT as its first woman chair. Thank you for having me. Perhaps we could start off with a general overview of what's going on at MIT, including a few of the things that are most important on our campus these days. Sure, thank you, Whitney. MIT is an incredibly important and special place. It convenes the world's top scientists, engineers, economists, and really across every discipline and initiative that MIT touches. And it's the people that make MIT, including the alum. We graduate over 2000 students every year, and that's just an immense contribution to our world, along with our pathbreaking research and discoveries. Each of you gathered for this conversation today carry that unique MIT training and experience into the world. On leadership, it's likely that all of us here today have faced challenges in our leadership journeys. I certainly have. Later this evening, you'll have an opportunity, opportunity to network and talk amongst yourselves on that topic. I'm sure that'll be the best part of the meeting and I wish I could participate. But I do wanna take this moment and call out the first woman president of the MIT Club of Japan in its 111 year his history. Joining us is Sawaka Romaine, class of 01. Congratulations and great to have you. And now I'll begin some remarks about the MIT Corporation, what's going on at MIT. First, the role of the MIT Corporation the corporation has 75 voting members and we're in charge of the governance of MIT. We have an unusually large corporation because of our important role chairing MIT's famed visiting committees. Every other year, each of our 36 departments and institutes hold a two-day review. Those visiting committees are chaired and staffed by corporation members, as well as outside academic and industry luminaries. The corporation also meets four times a year where we discuss matters of importance. Last August, I surveyed the corporation about what they considered most important. The number one area of interest was MIT's engagement with the global community, our international opportunities and challenges. At our last corporation meeting earlier this month, we held a special session with MIT's China Strategy Group. That is a collection of MIT's faculty that are focused on MIT's engagement with China. We followed that the next day with a talk by Gang Chen, who told us about his seriously unfortunate experience with the United States China initiative, now thankfully terminated. Gang is, a, is globally respected and a highly awarded professor of mechanical engineering, and he was the former department head. He was arrested in January 2021 and could not participate at MIT for a year. In January of 2022, all of his charges were dismissed. You can read about his poignant experience in science and other publications or see interviews with him. A simple Google of Gong Chen will give you the pointers. And let me turn to some news on campus. Among MIT's foremost priorities, the Institute continues to, to work to foster and support an inclusive culture and diverse community on campus. Every visiting committee now spends time on diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI as we call it. 
There are ongoing efforts at every level of MIT and across every constituency. And there is tremendous progress. And as one indicator, for the first time, over half of next year's admitted class are female. March 14th, or Pi Day, is the day we notify prospective students that they've been admitted. There were 1,337 students admitted to the class of 2026, and that was out of an applicant pool of 33,796 for an overall acceptance rate of 3.96%. Should have been 3.14%. And 51% are female. A delightful indicator of MIT's uniqueness is the annual Putnam Math Competition. It's a grueling six hour math proof exam. And this year, MIT took all five of the top spots and 24 of the top 30 spots, I believe. The top score this year was 119 out of 120 points. The median score on the exam was four out of 120 points. MIT is evolving to meet the challenges of our world. Last month, we made an exciting announcement that will complement MIT's already outstanding training with a focus on human design. We announced the MIT Morningside Academy for Design. This academy will bring design-focused education across the Institute. It's a major interdisciplinary center, and we expect it to become a global hub for design research, thinking, and entrepreneurship. It will let us put design thinking, if you will, human-centered or life-centered thinking front and center in everything that we do. It's exciting because the Academy will foster collaboration and innovation across the entire campus. The hub will be housed in the School of Architecture and Planning and will support and encourage design work at MIT in all our disciplines, engineering, science, management, computing, architecture, urban planning, and the arts. This initiative and academy will strengthen our ability to tackle all kinds of pressing global issues, including climate, adaptation, public health, transportation, and civic engagement. Turning to the leadership transitions at MIT, it's an exciting time. There've been a number of leadership changes in the past 12 months. I expect that you've been following them. I'll save the most important for last. First, Melissa Nobles was appointed to succeed Cindy Barnhart as the chancellor in 2021. That she was formerly the Dean of Shafts in, or the School of Humanities and Social Studies. So we also appointed a new Dean there, uh, Augustin Rayo. He's a fellow MIT alum Augustin earned his PhD in 2001, and he's a philosophy professor focused on logic, metaphysics, and the philosophy of language. Then in early March, Marty Schmidt, who's an alum of electrical engineering, left his post as MIT provost. He's moving to be president at his undergraduate alma mater, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Following in the footsteps of alumna and member of the corporation, Shirley Ann Jackson, class of 68, PhD in 73, and she led RPI for 23 years. MIT's new provost is Cindy Barnhart. Cindy earned the entire community's respect during her seven years as the chancellor. During that time, Cindy addressed many student life issues and led much of the COVID on campus execution. As a member of the senior faculty team since 2014, she worked closely with Marty on a range of issues. She's warmly received as our new provost and able to hit the ground running, as they say. That smooth transition is especially important given the other big news that I alluded to. President Rife's recent announcement that he will step down as president at the end of 2022. As Raphael has conveyed, this was not an easy decision for him. And he takes such great pride in leading the MIT community. But with so much progress made during his term, 
so much of it made possible by the historic MIT campaign for a better world, he felt it was the right time. We're now starting the search for MIT's 18th president. This search will be unhurried and broad based. The, the president will be voted on by the, the president elect will be voted on by the corporation and the search committee will include corporation members, faculty, students, and staff. In my role as chair, I appointed John Jarvie, class of 78, master 79, as chair of the search committee. John's a lifetime member of the corporation, a past president of the Alumni Association, and a recipient of the Bronze Beaver Award, the highest honor the association bestows upon its volunteers. He's high, a highly regarded venture capitalist in tech and a smart, forward-looking individual. We can all feel fortunate to have such an accomplished person chairing the search. He has a global perspective and significant experience recruiting and hiring senior executives. He's also been deeply involved at MIT and knows many of the faculty and administration well. It's an exciting time for a new president to start their time at the Institute. Raphael has done a phenomenal job and we have phenomenal faculty and students. We're one of the very top educational and research institutions in the world. Our financial condition is good and our magical Institute is forward looking and excited about the future. Gosh, Diane, thanks for that overview of what's going on from a corporation perspective. And just a reminder to us of all of the exciting things that are happening at MIT, uh, from the leadership transitions that are going so smoothly to the new programs that are being rolled out. It's just really great to hear um, your perspective on those things. I thought since um, our MIT Alumni Forum is focused on women and leadership, in addition to that great perspective from a corporation view, if you might share from your personal perspective, just a little bit about yourself and your personal uh, story of leadership. Do you wanna share some thoughts? Oh, I'd be happy to do that, right. Whitney. You know, I had excellent training. I came to MIT with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering in 1976. I did so at the recommendation of the chair of my mechanical engineering department, and I believe that it shaped the rest of my life. MIT was full of amazing people, the likes of which I'd never encountered before in such a condensed setting. And one of my favorite quotes from the time was, if someone says it is impossible, at MIT we say that it might take a little bit longer. <laughs> I was also introduced to artificial intelligence at MIT. This was in 1976, it became a lifelong interest. MIT was a pioneer through people like Marvin Minsky and Patrick Winston who were leading the effort back in 1976. I was also a sailor. I grew up in a house on the water with a dock in front and was rowing my own boat from the age of five. I soon started racing sailboats, and as a skipper, I think that's where I developed leadership skills. I learned to be well prepared for almost anything, how to lead a team and give everyone on the boat a clear role, to be decisive, make decisions in real time when necessary, how to set a strategy and then adapt it to cha changing circumstances. In the case of sailing, it might be the competition, the weather, or an equipment breakdown. I left MIT as a naval architect and worked what, what was then an industry that hadn't yet embraced women as equals. I would, could work in the office, but not in the field since, since the accommodations were for men only. So I learned programming in the office and then I decided to return to school and, and finally study AI. After earning a second master's at UC Berkeley in computer science, I entered tech. I worked in several companies and then <clears throat> in 1994 left to do a startup. I ended up as I went in to run engineering and ended up as CEO of a, I could say ahead of its time streaming video company. Uh, we could stream videos that were sort of postage stamp sized at that time because of the limited bandwidth. 
But nonetheless, Microsoft bought us a year later and we came, became the basis for their offerings in streaming media. Then I co-founded and led VMware, the virtualization company for 10 years. I took it public in 2007 for a $19 billion valuation. After that, I did some investing, my proudest being the 3D software company Unity, which I found in Copenhagen when they were 12 people. I started serving on boards, Unity's as a small startup, and then two public companies, Intuit and Google, then became Alphabet. The Google board seat led to my joining Google to build their cloud initiative, which we called Google Cloud. I spent three years putting an enterprise division together and growing revenues from about a billion to an $8 billion run rate. I had just stepped down from the Alphabet board and, and the Google Cloud CEO role when the corporation and Raphael asked me to come and be MIT's chair. Before me, it was called chairman, and we had quite a discussion and, and renamed it chair. Diane, thank you for that. You know, that's really an amazing arc from rowing your own dinghy to um, being the chair uh, at MIT and all that happened in between. Um, you paused on tech just a little bit and, and noted it was a different kind of industry with some built in challenges, but if you could it might be interesting to the group to hear you talk a little bit about particular lessons in leadership you learned um, that are specific to that industry. Sure, Whitney. Uh, you know, I, I really can't underestimate the importance of setting a vision, adapting it as you go, and making sure everyone in the organization understands and buys into it. Also making sure everyone understands what their role is in contributing to the vision. And then of course, making sure we have the right people in the right roles and making sure everybody is successful and happy. Just those little things, right? But <laughs> those are wise simple, categories. Though. <laughs> yes, yes, and easy to keep in mind. Uh, you know, with that clarity of vision, still uh, sometimes things can be you know, not as natural for leaders. And so I wonder if you have anything you'd like to share that you wish you maybe had learned sooner uh, in, that, in that trajectory. Well, I was fortunate to learn as, by building small companies, by building startups. And I, because I was very shy when I started running my first company, I would get nervous in front of people, but but we started out, you know, having town halls with 12 people. And of course, by the time I left, they were 8,000 at, at VMware and 25,000 at Google. So I incrementally learned how to speak in front of people and, and that made it easy. I'm, I tend to be very straightforward and goal oriented, which works extremely well with engineers and MIT type people, but um, I think something I learned over time as I worked with a broader range of people was, and sometimes people I couldn't necessarily trust, was how to bring them along through diplomacy. And that's kind of a lifelong lesson in some ways. You learn something new from each person you encounter, or that's what I find anyway. It's, it's really right. a it never ends. You keep, Right, you keep building that. Diane, thank you so much for sharing these uh, perspectives on the Institute and insights about yourself and your own leadership experiences. I know that our community has really appreciated hearing from you today. Um, thank you so much for your time for this conversation. Oh, Whitney, it's been my absolute pleasure. And I wish everyone here all the best and uh, wish I could be meeting with you later on uh, live in person over Zoom. Um, there is just so much to be proud of at MIT, and I certainly am probably the proudest. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I really enjoyed speaking with Chair Green and learning uh, some great lessons from her, and we're really happy to be able to share that with you today. Um, I am at this point very honored to introduce our next speaker, 
MIT Alumni Association President Annalisa Weigel. Annalisa began her one-year term as president of the MIT Alumni Association this past July. Her long history with MIT includes four degrees from the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics, where she later went on to serve as an assistant professor for several years. Um, also the program in Science, Technology, and Society and the Engineering Systems Division. Annalisa, my partner in crime here at the AA, I will hand the virtual podium over to you. Good morning. Thanks very much, Whitney. Uh, I'm so glad to have the honor of being with you all today to share information briefly about the Alumni Association Board of Directors and additional work coming from the Alumni Association. The vision of the MIT Alumni Association is to engage and inspire the global MIT community to make a better world. I am proud to be serving with this distinguished group here of alumni and alumni volunteers as the board works together to engage all of you across the planet to make that vision a reality. Having reached the midpoint of my time as president of the Alumni Association, I'm reflecting on the work of the board and how appreciative I am about the enthusiasm and engagement of our alumni to stay connected to each other and back to the Institute. Your willingness to volunteer for your club, class, or group to advise students or to interview prospective students is just inspiring, and I offer my deepest gratitude for all your hard work. Whether you volunteer for MIT, donate to the annual fund, or attend events, your engagement is important. The lifelong commitment of our alumni continues to create a vibrant global community. A partnership between alumni volunteers and the professional staff led to the co-creation of the MIT Alumni Association Strategic Plan, which has provided us with a blueprint for our success since its inception in 2018. With each passing year, this partnership has strengthened our organization. It has also created some of the exciting programming Whitney previously shared with you, and one that I would like to highlight now, the MIT Alumni Better World Service Initiative. This initiative, which debuted last fall, was born of the knowledge that our MIT alumni and alumnae are doing work in their local communities and in broader communities to make a better world. The board, as well as our alumni, saw an opportunity for the Alumni Association to serve as a platform to facilitate connections of alumni doing service or who are interested in service, and to post service projects and to highlight the contributions our alumni are making around the world. So in essence, the MIT Alumni Better World Service Initiative was created to illustrate to the MIT community and to the world that our alumni are force multiplier for good. Parts networking site, workspace, project aggregator and storytelling platform, this initiative supported by the association connects MIT people working to make a better world through their volunteer efforts across climate and sustainability, across human health, STEM education, social justice and equity, and much more. There are multiple ways that alumni can get involved. Alumni can create a project and post it to the site so that others can join it, or they can become part of a project someone else has created, or they can share a story, or they can nominate someone else to recognize their service. Promotion of the program has been ongoing on the association's digital platforms through editorial content and in events such as this one, and most of all through peer-to-peer -peer engagement and through our service ambassadors. A commitment to make a better world through service to our community and to causes we care about, to the industries in which we work, the cities and towns in which we live, to our families and loved ones, that might be the greatest way that MIT alumni can be living examples of leadership in action. Hearing Diane's comments about leadership causes me to reflect on leadership as well. You know, we generally think about leadership as how you align and motivate people to work towards a common goal. And we know leadership can manifest itself in very different ways, depending on the leader and the circumstance and our leadership skills and styles are always evolving and adapting. Some of my own earliest formal leadership experiences actually came as an undergraduate student at MIT. And for those opportunities that MIT provided me, I remain to this day very grateful. Leading student groups on campus allowed me to begin learning the art of leadership by actually doing it. 
and taught me valuable lessons and principle, which I have continued to evolve and refine through a diverse professional career, through volunteer service, and even through raising a family. I see leadership development as a continuous journey we're all on, learning from our own and each other's experiences. And because of this, I'm excited for our event this evening and for what we can all learn from our speakers and from each other. So let's go ahead and stop sharing the slides, please. It is now my pleasure to introduce a fabulous leader in her own right, Lillian Kiang from the class of 2000. She's a fellow member of the MIT Alumni Association Board of Directors. Lillian is the CEO of Beisheng Tang Foundation, a private foundation of a prominent family in Hong Kong. The foundation focuses on education, catalyzing development of positive education in local public schools and providing scholarships for underprivileged students to pursue education overseas. And also on Chinese art and culture through advancing scholarship, through supporting scholars, curators and university and museum projects globally. After nearly two decades of traditional world, uh, after two decades in the traditional world of finance, first on Wall Street and then as Director of Investment at Temasek Holdings and Deputy Chief Manager at CK Asset Holdings, leading over 10 billion US dollars worth of international acquisitions, Lillian aspires to apply her investment experiences to generate a different kind of return, social impact that will enable a more inclusive and flourishing community for our next generation. Lillian's MIT volunteerism includes serving as term director of the MIT Alumni Association, the immediate past president of the MIT Club of Hong Kong, and member of the advisory board to the MIT Hong Kong Innovation Node. She is also a 2020 recipient of the Harold E. Lobdell 17 Distinguished Service Award from the MIT Alumni Association. Over to you, Lillian. Thank you, Annalisa, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm just truly honored and grateful for the opportunity um, to share a bit about my humble journey and perspective on leadership, especially on the back of, of Chair Green and Whitney and Annalisa sharing and reflections. Um, really, as I look back on my younger self, um, I chose where I study, what to study, or even where I worked based on what I deemed to be very safe choices. Um, my definition of success at each stage of my life uh, was heavily influenced by what those I love perceived to be the right next steps. So this formula worked well for the longest time because it was aligned with my own love of learning and it, it gave me the chance and immersed me amongst some of the most smart, brilliant and impressive role models and colleagues, uh, many of whom have since become lifelong friends. And perhaps it's the MIT DNA in me. I, I just loved looking for opportunities where I get to drink from the fire hose. Uh, I was almost addicted um, to the adrenaline, adrenaline rush of being part of the action and winning. Um, but it wasn't until about two decades into my career in the investment world that a mentor actually stopped and asked me, um, he literally asked me, are you tired of doing deals yet? And um, this question came at a time, you know, it really took me by surprise. And um, it came at a time when I just had my second child. And long story short, it, this question made me really pause and, um, and led to an intensive period of soul searching <laughs> and ultimately gave me the courage to try a, a make a career choice. I guess that massively deviated from this formula of safety that I grew up with. Um, and led me to my current role as the CEO of a nonprofit uh, of a philanthropic organization, um, focusing on domains where I have absolutely no expertise in, <laughs> serving an ecosystem of internal and external stakeholders who I've never worked with before. Um, but this source of courage really came from, I guess, in alignment with my desire to really kind of focus my day job on giving back. Um, not to be cliche, but really campaign for a better world, I think, as, as um, everyone has, um, has said and shared. And I think that's very much an MIT-ness in me. <laughs> um, but ultimately to embark on a new journey to hopefully become the kind of person that I wish to be remembered as. Um, so that's a brief summary of, of kind of my journey so far. Um, but tonight, I'm actually most excited to be able to spend time with uh, a pair of outstanding alumni uh, who will share with us all of um, their paths to, to leadership, as well as their perspectives and thoughts. Um, mm -hmm. First person is Anjali Law. 
MBA class of 2019. Anjali believes in the power of compassion, courage, and collaboration in driving lasting systematic change in education and beyond. Um, currently, she's the Director of Strategy and Programs at Catalyst Education Lab. Uh, CEL enables, um, she, she enables school-based transformation in Hong Kong through facilitating teacher to professional development and change management. And prior to CEL, Anjali has been a management consultant at Boston Consulting Group. She was an EdTech sector practice co-leader at MIT's Entrepreneurship Center, and she was a government appointed member of the Hong Kong Commission on Youth. She had the privilege to work with schools, nonprofits, corporations, and governments on their challenges related to strategy, growth, impact, and efficiency. She also has extensive experience coaching students on Chinese debate, international business case competition, entrepreneurship, and just life in general. Anjali holds an MBA from MIT Sloan, uh, where she explored the intersection of education, management, and innovation. She's also a certified compassionate systems man, uh, master's practitioner, um, working with other global leaders to cultivate deep thinking and well being in the education space. The second very important person, as Chair Green has uh, given a shout out to, is Sawaka Romain, class of 01, um, who is the MIT Club of uh, Japan's first woman president in 111 years. She graduated from Course 7 uh, undergrad and has always been active in the community activities. Um, she co-founded the J Japanese Society of Undergrad and held officer positions and several others. Since graduating from MIT, she has worked in several industries, including pharma, entertainment. She actually worked for the World Club at some point as well. <laughs> and she's currently the consultant at CAC CNC, advising the Japanese government and Fortune 500 companies on strategic communication. And she hosts a radio show to promote studying abroad. She's also the 2018 recipient of the Margaret L.A. McVicker um, Award. So, Anjali, if I may, uh, let me begin with you. Uh, um, share about your path to date and your perspective on leadership, or how, uh, maybe more broadly, how have you navigated kind of your career choice and uh, what have been the guiding principles of your, your choice? Uh, thank you, Lillian, so much for the kind introduction and, and question. And hi, everyone. Um, this is Anjali, and it's really an honor to be invited to, to share my story. Uh, I just happened to, to see uh, yesterday in a social media post by Adam Grant, uh, the author of the book Give and Take, yesterday. And he talked about how big career decisions don't come with a map but all you need is a compass and that the right next move is the one that brings you a step closer to living your core values. And I, I totally agree with that. Um, the core values is, is definitely one of uh, my guiding principles for my career choices. And one of the, the key turning points in my career, I would say, uh, happened in 2016, March uh, specifically. Uh, back then, I was a management consultant, living quite an exciting life, flying to different cities, solving problems for big corporations across industries. But then in, in one of the plane rides, I, I, I found a very exhaustive self asking myself, well, why aren't I as motivated as I thought I, I would be? And while a lot of the, the projects were intellectually challenging, I just didn't find it as personally meaningful. And so as I then started really some serious soul searching, as uh, uh, Lillian has, has also mentioned. Um, at, at that time in Hong Kong, March 2016, a student suicide incident just was reported in the Hong Kong news. And then two more a few days later, and by the end of that month, nine and um, total of, of 35 that, that year. And the intensity of what happened was really shocking to me and I can't help but wonder why is this happening what is really going on why am I so frustrated and I then chose to really pursue an MBA at Sloan to really unpack this key question of 
what do I truly want to grow in, in life? And um, it, it's certainly a, a work in progress. And, uh, um, and really, um, I guess my latest iteration, I would say of my vision statement would be to really grow the brave and safe spaces to empower learners to make mindful choices for our future. And I see that as the why in everything I, I do in my career. And that uh, helps me then make choices about the exact what and how I, I, I do things. And so I think all in all, it's that maximizing of meaning and learning that I see as um, my guiding principles. Thanks, Anjali. Um, and Sawaka, you've had a very interesting and varied career. Uh, love to hear more. Um, and also, especially as, as the first female president of the MIT Global Japan. Thank you, Lillian, uh, for your kind introduction. And um, I also feel very honored to be able to speak here at this event um, after these great uh, women in leadership roles. Uh, I especially felt really uh, honored when uh, Chair Green mentioned my name in her speech. <laughs> that was a surprise, but a great, you know, awesome surprise. Um, so briefly explaining my background, it's definitely not the conventional <laughs> background. And um, I've done, um, you know, multiple different careers. Um, but to start out, like, briefly from the beginning. Um, I grew up in Mexico and from there I went to MIT and with the intention to either become a researcher or a doctor. So I studied biology and I shadowed um, both careers while I was at MIT. Uh, but after shadowing, I actually realized that I wanted to work actually more in something that uh, relates directly to people. And I also had another uh, passion, which was uh, in the music. So after graduating from MIT, I moved to Japan to pursue my music career. And then I also worked uh, in different jobs, including pharmaceutical marketing research, TV hosting, uh, event planning, et cetera, uh, while also pursuing uh, my music career. And um, after producing and releasing my own uh, CD and music, um, there was one point in time that I realized that I don't actually need to, you know, do my passion for music into an actual career. Because sometimes when you do whatever you love the most into a job, there might be an occasion that you might end up having to do something that you don't want to. And I realized um, I didn't have to do that. You know, I could uh, switch a career to something that I'm good at. And while I um, keep on singing in the things that I just want to do. So I decided to make a career change. And back then um, I was, you know, pondering what would be something that would utilize my communication skills and my language skills. And a, a friend of mine suggested me that I should uh, look into uh, PR, the public relations and communications, because I had the skills that I could. And ever since then, uh, I've been helping companies and also the government um, with their communication strategies. So, you know, one thing I learned through my career is that it's uh, never too late to change careers. And I'm sure you guys also felt the same way too. <laughs> and through your profiles, I, I could see that, you know, you also went through the career changes. And um, as for the role as the first uh, woman president of the MIT Club of Japan. So uh, as Lillian, in, uh, you introduced me, I was also quite active while I was a student at MIT um, in holding you know, leadership roles in the um, student clubs. It seems like Annalisa was also that way, but, um, and ever since I graduated uh, in Japan, I was also uh, holding, um, conducting volunteer activities. And at um, one point in time, I also joined the MIT Club of Japan. And after serving as a vice president of the MIT Club of Japan for three years, uh, this year 
in January, I was appointed as the first uh, woman president of the club. And um, I want to use this occasion to briefly introduce the goals I have for this club. Um, and I um, wanted to, you know, visualize my goals in a very easy to um, convey way. So I have three pillars, which is uh, in was the let that start all with the letter I. So I want to make uh, MIT Club of Japan a very a more inclusive uh, club, where both members and directors, you know, are um, of different um, diverse background. Um, and I also, the second I is to make uh, MIT Club of Japan more informative. So we're thinking about, you know, opening more uh, social media channels like LinkedIn and Twitter so that um, not only just the members, but also prospective students and the general public can also um, know more about MIT and the MIT Club of Japan as well. And maybe also other clubs in Asia too, that'll be great as well. And the last pillar is to make MIT Club of Japan more inspiring. So, um, you know, MIT also had this goal of the better word as well. But um, in Japan, I don't know if it's the same way in, in the um, other Asian countries as well, but uh, the gender gap of uh, STEM education is really large. And it would be great if for, in some way I could, you know, inspire more people to study the STEM field. And as next year marks, uh, the 150th year anniversary of the, since the first woman graduated from MIT. Like I really want to do some kind of event to promote um, STEM education. And it will be great if, you know, we can collaborate also for that, <laughs> especially because you both are in the education field. So, you know, as being the first uh, woman president, I, I really feel honored that by being the face of the club, I can serve as an inspiration to other women students that it is possible to study at MIT, even if you are a woman, and that it is possible to become a leader, even as a woman. Thank you. Thank you, Anjali and Saoka. Thank you both for, for your initial thoughts. Um, mm -hmm. And I definitely echo what Saoka, you said. I think we've come a long way, right? I think in terms of gender gap um, in our own respective careers and experiences. And it, there's so much to be grateful for. And, um, and uh, but clearly I think there's still a lot more work to be done. Um, so again, you know, want to start uh, we're now in kind of our Q&A session. If, if it's okay, I'll kick off a question more broadly again um, on the theme of today's discussion. So how, how do you see leadership, right? I think as I think the three of us sit around, you know, we're kind of still at kind of the, as uh, Anjali called the growth stage in our career. We're still <laughs> compared to our previous speakers, you know, we're not kind of at, at that, um, uh, well, compared to Chair Green, we're a long way to go. Uh, <laughs> but how, how do you see leadership uh, at where you stand? Where you sit up? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's certainly a, a big and complex question in itself. And I guess I could further narrow the scope a little bit to, to talk about how MIT specifically uh, influenced my, my thinking about leadership. And I think that the first um, is what thing I want to say is is more an, an observation of how I see MIT folks feel leadership. I just feel that many of us don't necessarily aspire to be leaders. It, it's more about following our, our, our passion for solving some of the big complex problems that we see and then figure out what we need to do about it and what role we should be playing. And so there's this strong emphasis of being a lot more problem led and context driven. And that mindset is, is quite common, I see among MIT people that I come to know of and, and something that I, I really appreciate. Um, the, the, the second thing is, is really that differentiation between a mindset of driving change and cultivating growth. 
Um, this, this idea specifically is brought forward by uh, Peter Sange, uh, one of our MIT thought leaders on, on learning organization, and someone that I'm really privileged to continue to learn from through the Compassionate Systems Initiative that MIT is advocating in the education space. And so driving change, um, this, this word tends to be very common in our vocabulary, but if, if we think about it, it's, it's very mechanical. It's about fixing problem, exert, exerting some force to, to pull um, an entity or something to a specific direction in, in quite a forceful way. But does this mechanical approach really bring about effective change? Um, I guess we, we actually see a lot of these um, happening real life in, in Hong Kong society these days or even other parts of the world in, in a lot of the leaders. But it, it in fact have created a lot of tension and, and pressure. So instead, if we think about cultivating growth, thinking more like a gardener, then, then it's a lot more about what are the generative conditions of the system that we need to cultivate? What are the forces um, that are the interplay among those, those forces and how we allow that collective intelligence to, to emerge? And a lot more about sort of the creative orientation of growing instead of simply changing things and, and getting rid of what we, we don't want. And I feel that these, these two points bit the more sort of um, 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 problem led and, and emergent mindset is, is how I see MIT itself operating too. We are not so much about the ranks or the top down control or the rigid structure, but a lot of the innovation and the progress um, in, in, in MIT is much more of that problem-led, bottom-up, emergent mindset. So that's that's some of the uh, observations I have. Thanks, Anjali. Uh, I think it, you've definitely brought up a very good analogy as a gardener, as opposed to a more mechanical approach. To some degree, it's almost counterintuitive, right? I think from an engineering perspective or from a science perspective, you always try to find a critical path to something and then hopefully <laughs> you effect the most efficient change. Um, but as you said, I think when it comes to sustainability of change, and I think as we deal with more and more variables, right, I think there's certainly a need for a different approach as well. Mm -hmm. How about you, Sawaka? Um, I definitely, you know, echo what uh, Angeli say, um, especially the first part of like, you know, especially the MIT people wanted to plural themselves. Like uh, in my case, for example, when I founded the um, uh, Japanese Society of Undergrads when I was at M and MIT, you know, the main reason why I did it was because there was no clubs. So <laughs> I wanted to solve the problem. And that's why, you know, somebody had to take the initiative. So um, a lot of times it comes from initiative and having been the dedication to change and do something right so in that sense I do completely agree with that but um, on top of that I also think that um, in order to be, be you know a leader you also need to have a good team that trusts you and help you and uh, also a good support system and um, one of the main reasons that I was able to become the president of the MIT Club of Japan was that um, I had a very very strong ally so the former president, um, Kato-san, uh, nominated me as a vice president uh, with the intention that in the future, he would want to support me to become the first female uh, president. So if it wasn't uh, for somebody like that, you know, I don't think I would be here right now. And um, to be able to have someone that believes in you um, and support you means a lot. And um, in a way for me, when I was first um, considering becoming a president, I was a little bit intimidated because um, former presidents were not only had been all male, but they're usually all like presidents of like big companies, CEOs of respective companies. And they were usually more of an older generation. And um, but, uh, you know, one thing I realized is that, uh, well, as a younger female, 
uh, leader is that to be a leader, like age or gender or title, like doesn't really matter, right? So um, what really matters is to have the motivation and the power to take initiative and responsibility and be able to like pull others under the same goal and like have a clear goal so that people can actually understand and support you as well. Um, so, you know, I feel like in my case, like being completely different from the former presidents is actually a competitive edge because if I implement something completely different from the former leaders, people will say like, oh, well, it's Sawaka, she's different. So maybe you know, that's okay, you know? <laughs> so yeah, I think there's, you know, many different um, factors to become uh, what leadership is. You know? Well, it's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm rooting for you, Sawaka. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's definitely not, um, I, I totally echo what you said about having allies. Right? I think it's, it's always, maybe this is a, a, a female thing, right? I, I, I feel like we tend to need a lot more reassurance sometimes to, to be able to kind of make that leap of faith or go out of our comfort zone. So having allies or people who kind of see a side of us or believe in us, right? I think whether it's male or female or, you know, anyone across generations is always super, super helpful and, um, and yeah, rewarding. I, I actually see some people in, in the audience that is someone like that who brought me into the club as well. Um, if I may, I'm just going to, uh, Martin, <laughs> Martin I was the one who nudged me to join the club. And again, you know, it was, it was super intimidating to, to join the MIT Club of Hong Kong initially. Everybody in the club was super established. And, you know, as you said, like, they're all president CEOs of something. And then there's me, you know, like the lowly um, analyst in investment banking. <laughs> so, but it, it was definitely looking back, it was one of the most rewarding journeys to be, to be able to serve alongside uh, other MIT alumni. Um, I'm conscious, you know, if I want to make sure everyone have a chance to also, um, you know, raise questions, if you please do put your questions into the chat. Um, I, I'm just kind of warming up the stage and the, and the question. So um, please, please do so. Um, and while we wait for more questions to come in, um, I, I wanted to, again, since this is a Asia focused context, um, again, you know, in the, I think the US, there's a fair share of kind of um, diversity or DEI issues that, that um, you know, I think MIT has um, vividly faced and um, is working through. In your own personal experience, right, I think as a Asian woman, Asian female, have, have you actually experienced stereotypes or do you think the expectations are different um, than if we were a different, different uh, race, different gender? Um, I'll take, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll answer this. So definitely it's, it's different. Like even recently, you know, just because um, women especially is thought to ha take a larger role when it comes to like childcare, um, you know, in like, for example, in, even in promotions or even like a job offers, uh, it, I think actually, Two years ago, I was actually um, I was offered the job, but once they find out that I had a young child, they actually um, canceled the offer. So there are even like places that do that, e even in this like current era, because you know um, they expect usually the women to be the main caregiver, and so and. And even in promotions and stuff, like in Japan, for example, the women in uh, the leadership roles in companies is only 13.3%. Uh, and that's really low, low you know? So, um, but the main reason is, is because it's usually the women who do the child um, care and they expect that, you know, if, uh, if it's a woman, they'll eventually, have to take a maternity leave or you they would probably be more prone to like leave the company which you know sometimes is not really the case but a lot of the people still think that way so there's definitely definitely a huge gap and the stereotype um to be uh women and i don't know if this is only in asia i mean i'm, I'm sure it also happens in other places in the world but 
yeah, there's still a huge gender gap. I, I guess for me, I do want to acknowledge the privilege that I don't think in in um, my entity, my identity as a woman has really been a limiting or constrained factor. Um, fortunate that I'm a single child with a very open minded parents. My schooling was in an all girls primary and then secondary school and um, living here in, in Hong Kong in a very internationalized city. I never felt that explicitly or subtly um, in any ways that I, I was seen in, in any way inferior as a woman. Though I, I, I guess everyone has their sort of constraints and expectations being imposed on, on them. I personally feel it was more externally from the environment in Hong Kong, more the narrow definition of success as to um, say, for example, in, in, in my school, how being a doctor or lawyer is seen as sort of a better choice with, with higher social standing. And um, there's also this internal aspect of um, what I, I would call that the perceptual awareness. I am, and it's, it's just in, in this few years that I realized I have perhaps this inner monologue of feeling that I'm not good enough. And it's, it's hard to exactly attribute whether it has anything to do with um, my gender or, or the, the culture setting or, or, or whatnot. Some research um, still debating on whether women tends to have um, more of the imposter syndrome or, or whatnot. Um, but I, I guess being aware of such of this sort of mental model in itself is, is helpful in, in rethinking whether I have limited myself on what I think I can accomplish in, in, in reality. So I'm also curious if, if that's um, something that's influencing the, the thinking and um, um, acting from um, personal or, or career life in, in general. And to answer that question about like, you know, the imposter syndrome, I do not have that feeling just because I'm a woman. But instead of that, I feel like I have to be even more successful than men sometimes, because if I fail, they will attribute it to my gender. So and you know, that I feel like that's unfair, but because it's a different quality that we have, people could, you know, think that it's because of that if I fail so that I feel like much more responsibility to succeed because of that. Uh, so in that sense, I feel like I have more pressure. Mm. And I also as you in terms of like, you know, stereotype that you were saying that, you know, you have to act a certain way, like in Japan, too, like I feel um, women usually you know we are um people say that it's actually better for women to stay more humble and non-aggressive and not too vocal you know not straightforward and um which you know makes some people a bit more shyer to like speak up in like meetings and conferences and stuff and which would maybe you know in general might make a seem that we are not more, uh, participating as much, right? So in that sense, those could uh, pile up and um, become also hindrance to, to become promoted as well, right? Because we're not seen as more, um, you know, aggressive and working hard to get something, right? So there's definitely that uh, discrepancy, you know? And I feel like what, uh, men, is actually, you know, when they're really like, you know, working hard and like being aggressive and stuff like that, it's not seen as aggressive, but it's on, only seen as like doing, you know, working hard on their job. But when we as women, if do we do something similar, we might be seen a little bit like being too arrogant. I don't know. But, you know, sometimes you see studies like that too as well, right? That we actually 
could act in a certain similar way in behavior wise, but um, it could be taken in a completely opposite way. So how about you, Lillian? Like, yeah, no, you, I, felt, yeah. <laughs> you see me nodding away the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing head exercise, but I don't fully agree. I think what um, I agree, I, I don't feel that imposter syndrome thing, but I agree with very much what uh, Sawaka was saying about that pressure that you put on yourself, that you just have to be that much better um, to, because the cost to, of failing or the cost of not delivering seems to have a wider implication on kind of women at large, right? You don't want to fall into that, um, reinforce any stereotypes, I guess, so to speak. So I think there is definitely that. Um, and um, yeah, I, I definitely think, I think oftentimes, you know, whether it's a cultural thing, I, I definitely for myself personally, I, I've sold myself short many times. Um, you know, I, I was thinking through how many times in my life have I really fought for something that I think I deserve? I think I, can't really like career wise. Like I don't really remember, like I've never negotiated salaries, never negotiated, you know, like, <laughs> like a lot of things until recently where it's funny because now I've, my entire career in the investment side has always been in a very male dominated environment. Like my bosses, most of my colleagues are male. Um, but now the organization I lead is 80% is, uh, women. And in fact, I, I feel like there's a pressure because I'm female, they expect me to be more understanding, more accommodating. And, uh, you know, it's hard because as, as Anjali says, I'm trying to be the gardener. I, I'm really here. I'm brought in to bring in change. Uh, obviously, if things are, my chairman's always jokes, like if things are going really well, I wouldn't have to bring you in, right? So go ahead, bulldoze, make whatever changes you need to make. But it's really hard because I feel pressured um, working with a large team of women. Um, and even, you know, our male colleagues, they're, they're very gentle, very kind people. Maybe that's also because from the field of philanthropy, I really feel challenged in terms of kind of how do I appear? How do I show up as a leader? Um, what kind of a leader should I be? So that's really interesting. I'm conscious we're coming up on time. Let me just um, pick up a question that's raised by the audience. Um, ah, okay, this is a question from, from uh, um, I'm trying to try to summarize a few. Uh, there's a question around whether the Japanese culture towards women has changed over the years, right? I think Zuen asked around 1980, um, their company project in Japan, the males visited our, our um, after work drinks and, and, and they, they hung out. And then uh, two of the female friends were officially uh, left out. Um, and then they were kind of left in fact to navigate the transportation system on their own. Um, yeah, so wondering, I mean, uh, Sawaka, if you can touch upon that. Uh, so I see two questions regarding the Japanese business culture, I guess, and one of them, whether COVID has changed uh, to more opportunities in leadership positions. Um, well, I don't know if COVID has changed this, but definitely like we have more opportunities in the sense of remote work. So uh, COVID has really pressured a lot of companies to move and digitalize. And um, even the government is trying to do like digital transformation. That's one of the pillars that they have. And when also like women empowerment has been a government pillar for a while as well. Uh, but in that sense, uh, because digitalization and digital transformation got accelerated because of COVID in that sense, it does have, I feel like empowered the women a bit more because then, you know, it's much more flexible uh, to be able to work from home. And so in that sense, I feel like it has. And um, in the question about like going out to drink afterwards and stuff, yes, definitely. Like, I feel like a lot of people now spend more time at home because they cannot go out as much. So in that sense, maybe. Um, but if that has direct impact on women, I'm not necessarily sure. Actually, there's studies saying that the um, gender pay gap uh, increased a bit more because uh, the effects of COVID had affected women more um, for like, for example, layoffs, especially because the percentage of women in part-time jobs is much higher than men. 
So uh, when there's um, economic crisis, like it's always uh, those part-time jobs that get laid off more. So in that sense, it, in some part, like in big companies, maybe like the position woman might have gotten better, but in general, maybe it might have affected more in a negative way. I mean, I, I'm not a professional in this area, so I wouldn't be able to say completely, but um, as much as I've read, I feel like that's been more the case. Um, but the government is also having more efforts in changing um, these, you know, situations. Um, for example, like, you know, they're trying to make the, um, how much you pay for like childcare, uh, you know, they made recently kindergarten free um for uh, for everyone pretty much um and i also think that they are um i think starting april 1st they're changing that any company with uh, 150 or so, you know, some certain number of employees have to have a certain percentage of women in uh, manager positions so you know they, they are working slowly but it's still not that great i mean like the recent um gender uh, gap uh, equality i think um system gave like a, it was like 120th in gender gap last year in japan like among like all the countries and it's that's really really low than the lowest among g7 nations so there's still a lot of um things that japan needs to do in terms of women in leadership thank you sawaka um, conscious where where time is almost up. If I could just ask one final question, um, which uh, I guess what roles have mentors played in your development? I think Angelie, you mentioned there were times where you have these kind of self doubts. You know, like were mentors a, a had a part to play in your development as a leader? Sawaka, you mentioned Kato-san, obviously mm -hmm. in, in that context. But just generally, like how. If you think back, like how or going forward, how would you con con continue to look for and find mentors uh, and role models for, for yourself? Um, well, you know, definitely fellow alumni <laughs> is, is great mentors. Like, I feel like everybody is always welcoming and just because you are, uh, you know, uh, same fellow alum. I feel like it's very easy to tap into that network and you know ask anything about anything. Uh, recently, I actually just got connected to um, a new uh, alum who just came to Japan through LinkedIn, and uh, he's working at like a embassy in India in Japan. So I was like, oh, cool, very interesting person. So like, you know, it's just random people that I connect to, right? So I feel like. Um, not being shy and just reaching out is a great way to get great mentors. Um, but in my personal case, actually, my spouse is actually a great mentor and cheerleader as well. I think one of the main reasons why I can actually do all these activities is because I have the support uh, from my partner. And that's, you know, definitely very important when it comes to being able to juggle many different um, roles um even if you have like a very young child right so but yeah definitely tap into your networks um i also um, find it very helpful to have uh life coaches you know or career coaches and um i i had one through like a network that people uh basically you know um like introduce me, but sometimes like, especially when you're facing like a career change and you are actually, you know, not sure what to do. Sometimes, you know, talking to these career coaches or life coaches makes it very clear, like how, what sort of uh, processes you should take to um, come up with your life plan. So yeah, that could be a tip as well. Yeah, I definitely agree with what, everything that Taka has, has said. But looking at it from another perspective, I think it's just having a learner mindset. Um, the, the, the mentoring role specifically, it's, it's a, a very specific subset, but I feel like that there's a lot to, to learn from even the, the both of you, not a formal mentorship, but, but learning. And 
I, I can't help as, as we have that conversation, um, think about um, the, the word leadership. And, and it's, it actually has this Indo-European root of liath. And it's really just as a simple, simplest form about how you step across thresholds. And, and I, I feel like simply hearing the stories that the both of you shared on what are the sh threshold that we have strived to, to step forward and motivate the people around us to, to, to step across to in itself is such great learning opportunities that inspire uh, uh, me and will inspire many others too. Well, thank you both. I mean, thank you, Saraka. Thank you, Anjali. It's really, we could go on <laughs> for hours and uh, really enjoy the time that we got to spend together. And uh, hopefully we will soon be able to catch up in person in due course, um, especially yeah. in Hong Kong when, when things are a little bit uh, more forgiving in terms of travels. <laughs> but many thanks also to Chair Green, to Annalisa for their involvement in the program tonight. And special thanks to you, Whitney, uh, for being our host of the program. Over to you, Whitney. That was great. Thanks to all three of you. And I, you may not be able to see it or hear it, but I'm going to lead the applause of everybody who is a part of the program today. I, I know um, you've inspired me and uh, I really enjoyed hearing about the specific context that you've work in, worked in, you've each worked in, but also to hear the commonality across the three of you that um, at a certain moment you paused and reflected what are my values? How do I want to be remembered? How do I make choices that aren't safe? And those are big, important questions that um, come to us each in our lives in different places. And it's been wonderful to hear how you worked through those and, um, and also to hear your optimism and forward-looking you know, uh, orientation as you've gone on those paths. Um, I wanna say uh, to our are those joining this conversation and who've been listeners, it's now your time to uh, use uh, the words of Angela, cross through the threshold into the breakout rooms where uh, you can have a learner mindset about other alumni that you can spend time with and uh, you know hear a little bit about their journey. And there are some suggested questions to help you get started. And there'll be some MIT Alumni Association staff um, who are in those rooms who will just help make sure that things flow easily for you. I hope you will join one of those breakouts. And um, the Zoom rooms will close. Uh, I'm supposed to tell you 930, but I wonder if we might push it a little bit later so that people have time to talk, although I know everyone has a busy schedule. With that, thank you all again. Thanks to our speakers. Thanks to our audience. and. Um, Thank you for staying connected to MIT and have a great day. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.